Now, the key thing to point out here is that what we have is so-called distinct eigenvalues. As in, when we do our computation and we get our characteristic polynomial, that what came out of it was two different values, and each of those two different values is associated with a single eigenvector, or at least a single family of eigenvectors we know we can multiply by a non-zero constant. I can then go and sketch the following geometric picture, which we've already seen, but I want to emphasize that it has two different lines. The line through 1, 1, which is where we are associated with the lambda equal to 3 and the stretching by 3, and the line through 0, 1, which is associated with the stretching factor by 2. And indeed, if we think about eigenvectors as they are some direction where the matrix is going to just stretch that direction vector by a scalar multiple, we in effect have two interesting directions in this scenario. For the next example that I want to show you, I've already gone and done the computation of the eigenvalues and the corresponding eigenvectors, but I want to point out a couple things. First of all, when I start with our matrix, we do our determinant equation to get to the characteristic equation, this polynomial in lambda that is going to have some number of solutions. And note that because it's a 2 by 2 matrix, this is going to be a degree 2 polynomial, and so it has, in theory, two different roots. But those roots may be distinct, different values as we saw in the previous case, or they may overlap, as occurs in this case. So what we get is only a single solution, lambda equal to 2, not the two different solutions we had before, a single solution. And what we say is that this is going to have algebraic multiplicity of 2. And this refers to the fact that we've got this exponent of 2 in the characteristic equation, that this particular root is squared, and so it, it sort of occurs twice even though it's just the one root, or it overlaps, however you want to think about it. But then, if I go and do my computation, the, the matrix that I get, the a minus lambda i, when I plug in lambda is equal to 2, my one eigenvalue, is just going to be this 0, 0, 0, 0 matrix. And the 0, 0, 0, 0 matrix, well, every vector x is going to satisfy ax equal to 0 when you've got the 0 matrix. So every single vector x except for the zero vector, because we don't call that an eigenvector, every non-zero vector x is going to be an eigenvector. And then when I think about what I want to do geometrically, any vector I have is going to be stretched by this multiple of 2. It doesn't matter where my vector is. They're always going to be stretched by this multiple of 2. Now, this should make sense. The, the matrix I began with, 2, 0, 0, 2, was the matrix we originally had talked about when we were first introduced to transformations as the idea of stretching by 2. It stretches every single vector by a factor of 2. One thing that we could do here if we wished was we could ask about the subspace of eigenvectors for the eigenvalue of lambda equal to 2. And indeed, the, the set of all such vectors we could prove would be a subspace. And because it's two-dimensional, it's an entire real plane, we could say that this so-called eigenspace has a basis, the 1, 0, and the 0, 1, to choose the standard basis for this two-dimensional thing. So when you think about it this way, what you get is a two-dimensional space generated by two vectors, 1, 0, and 0, 1. These are all the eigenvectors corresponding to lambda equal to 2. And then contrast that with the previous example where you got two different eigenvalues and gave you two different linearly independent eigenvectors. Either way, you have this sort of basis of eigenvectors. So note that for the moment. We're going to come back to that point in a few videos from now. This next example, however, turns things on its head a little bit. I go along and I compute my characteristic equation as normal. And again, what we have is a 1 minus lambda times a 1 minus lambda. We again have this 1 minus lambda squared. And so we again have a lambda equal to 1, and we again have an algebraic multiplicity of 2. But there's only the single eigenvalue. However, this time when I go to find my eigenvectors, when I go to solve ax equal to 0, we see that this is a matrix that has one leading one, or one pivot column, and one free column. And therefore, the solution to this homogeneous system is going to have one infinite family. It's an arbitrary parameter times 1, 0. So notice that in the first two examples, 
that there were both going to be two linearly independent eigenvectors that you could find. Maybe they corresponded to the same eigenvalue, or maybe they corresponded to different ones. But in this example, there's only one eigenvalue, and there's only one family of eigenvectors corresponding to it. It does not add up to the number two corresponding to the fact that we have a two by two matrix. So this is going to be interesting. There isn't much to draw here. We are just going to take the one vector one zero. Because it's a lambda of equal to one, it stretches not at all. And so in fact, any vector which is lying on the x-axis is just going to stay exactly where it is. Not moving at all is the same idea of just multiplying a factor of one. By the way, this particular transformation, we've seen it before, it's horizontal shear. So for instance, a vector like this one is just going to get transitioned to a vector like that one. Or if I start at that one, it's going to get transitioned to a vector like this one. That is, this is the transformation that is always going to keep its y component, always keep its height, but sort of push it off to the right. So then it should make sense that the x-axis is the only thing that has a stretching. Any vector here is not going to be just multiplied along its direction because it changes its direction as it shears off to the right. The only case where this is not true is when you're right down on the x-axis, you don't move at all and you have a stretching factor of one. So it makes sense that we only have one eigenvector given what this transformation does. The final two by two case that I want to investigate is this one, the matrix zero minus one, one zero. And you might have recognized this matrix before. This is the matrix that is rotation by 90 degrees counterclockwise. Now, before we even get to the computation, I want you to just visually think about what could the eigenvectors be? We're taking any vector like this and we're rotating it. Any vector like this and we're rot rotating it. We're rotating everything by this 90 degrees. So since every vector rotates, it can't be the case that any vector is only going to be stretching. And that's what eigenvector eigenvalues do. There you say, if you've got an eigenvector along that direction, it only stretches. It doesn't do anything else. So a pure rotation can't have any eigenvectors. But how does that manifest itself in the computation? Well, if I come along here and do the familiar work and, and try to get to my characteristic equation, there it is, lambda squared plus one is equal to zero, or if you prefer, you would take the plus one over to the other side. But you're saying a square, which is always positive, is equal to this negative thing. Well, that is only possible to solve if we use complex numbers, in particular plus and minus the imaginary number i. Now, there's a really big story here that's really relevant for a lot of things. However, we're not going to get to it in our course. I'm just going to give you all characteristic equations that always have real roots, just to keep our lives a little bit simpler. But this is going to be the way that we think of there not being any eigenvectors. You just don't have any eigenvalues that are real, and therefore don't have any corresponding real eigenvectors. The final example that I'm going to give you for this video is a situation where the matrix is much larger than 2 by 2. I was using 2 by 2 because they're short and quick and easy, but indeed we can ask about eigenvalues, eigenvectors for much larger matrices. And indeed, if this was the matrix A, and then I was to come along and be really interested in what a minus lambda i was going to be, then what this would do was it would put a minus lambda all the way along this main diagonal. And then if I wanted to go and compute the determinant of this, I wanted to figure out the determinant of a minus lambda i, I need to remind you of an algebraic trick. Notice how this matrix is already in its upper triangular form. Well, if it's in its upper triangular form, you might recall that the determinant was just going to be the product of all of those diagonal factors. So indeed, this is just going to be 2 minus lambda, since I'm just going to be going along this main diagonal here. So 2 minus lambda, and then it looks like a 1 minus lambda occurs three times, so I'm going to make it cubed, and that's going to be equal to zero. And so you get two different eigenvalues, maybe I'll call them lambda 1 equal to 2, and lambda 2 is equal to 1, where the lambda equal to 1, that's got this so-called algebraic multiplicity of 3.